All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here. I wanna thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your work with us and agreeing to do this demo with us. I'm really excited. Um, so I'm just gonna introduce Paul and then I'm just gonna let Paul take it away. So Paul Maloney is a visual artist born in Houston, Texas. He attended the University of Georgia completing his bachelor degrees in both art history and ceramics. He later would attain his MFA in ceramics from Indiana University, Bloomington. Paul has made work all throughout the United States, having opportunities at Haystack Mountain School of Craft, the Iowa Ceramic Center and Glass Studio Penland School of Crafts, the BASCOM, a center for visual arts and the John Michael Collars Arts Center. He now resides in Kansas City, Missouri, where he has been appointed to the position of studio manager and residency head at Belger Crane Yard Studios. So without further ado, I give you Paul Maloney. Yay! <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming in and checking out the demo. I appreciate it. Um, I figured what I would do in my studio space today is kind of a, a I was one to focus on just um, the forms that I, I kind of made in my show, but uh, I realized I have multiple forms of pieces that are in various stages of my process right now. So although they're not necessarily the jars, maybe I would also switch over to some cups and show you like how I'm thinking about adding and applying surface since I, I try to develop a lot of um, layers within all my wares just like I do with the feelings. So um, start from the ground level. Um, it's my kick wheel. Um, although it's normally used for throwing, I also like to use it as kind of like a standing banding wheel. And so I get to do a lot of like pinching and hand formation on top of my wheel top that I put um, more of these kind of like bat boards on top of it and it allows me to build. And uh, this is how the whole process starts. I'm, I'm gonna go reverse too um, in, this, in this point. So I want to come back to this piece that I'm gonna pull from this hole, but um, I kind of got the idea to make these jars from being in love with a lot of Korean ceramics. I think I fell um, in love naturally with Korean ceramics when I was at the University of Georgia. I was studying with Sung Ya, and we also had, um, as part of that department, um, so many amazing makers all coming from Korea, from Kyungmin Park to Taehyung Kim. Um, Sung Gu's partner, uh, Min Su, is also an exceptional potter. So it, I, it, it was just the perfect time to kind of delve into that rich history since um, they had such a great grasp of it. And I fell in love with moon jars. Um, I, I love their roundness, their asymmetry, their um, focus on imperfection in this sort of like subtle, cool, like glorious melancholy that they sort of produced. And so I wanted to try to figure out a way to make kind of my own impression of that jar at first. Um, and so I started with this mold and I had this idea that maybe I could hand build it rather than throw it on the wheel as it happened traditionally. And as I started making the piece, it became less and less about moon jars at all and kind of just became this um, platform for me to kind of be allowed to play and think about um, sort of relationships between neck, foot, and body, and that kind of be more of just a simple inference and jumping off point to kind of have a whole series of iterations of allowing me to work on new silhouettes, new themes, and uh, new written words that I um, scraffito carve and etch into all of my pieces. So um, to show you all how this works so far, um, this piece right now I built yesterday. I have this plaster mold that the piece is sitting in. And so this is basically a half shell of a sphere. And uh, I coil build uh, my form into here. And then I actually then build and construct the foot um, first. So this whole piece, if you imagine it is upside down. And now that it's been drying for about 24 hours and I haven't been adding any extra moisture and just letting it slow dry, I'm gonna be able to easily pop it out of the mold right now. So. Aha, great success. I didn't test it whether it would work or not, so I'm glad that it popped out like I wanted it to. So that's kind of how these forms start. Um, I'm going to have this set off to the side now, though, for a little bit, and I'm going to show you how I get to this first sphere. And so now I'm going to work backwards now that I've pulled this, like, Julia Child style, save the liver, I have this in the oven, no! Whole thing. Thank you. 
So now this is kind of what my mold looks like as it starts off. Really basic, nothing crazy. Um, if you can see though, there's a little bit of like this residue of little flecks of color. Um, kind of like monotype printing, I like to start with various uh, different colored clays called slip and I use them like paint. And uh, I've slowly over time with every iteration of all of the vessels that I have been making, every single one of them is riffing off of the composition of the one that's been taken off of before. So like, as I'm like building a, a different kind of history individually, they also have no matter what, whether it's words or not, uh, a similar tie theme between all of them chronologically. And so to kind of get more of this color in here, this is actually the first step before I even get to the building of the clay. Um, I like to have a little bit of painting fun. So got some brushes in this water bucket. These are a lot of materials that I'm using. Um, this here is a, a great brand that we, you know, shameless plugs right now. So working at Belgium, we have a wholesale shop called Crane Yard Clay that's right across from our gallery. So many good materials that we're able to buy in there, whether it's um, things like slips, glazes, all the clays that you can want. And this is one in particular that I've never had at my disposal up until moving here and uh, being able to buy this in Crane Yard Clay. This is a really nice warm green. That's normally not, um, yeah, of course I'm gonna rep the hat. Uh, <laughs> I found this when I was like moving and organizing things in my studio. So I was happy to find one that I get to rep all the time. But I love this green. Um, I'm a sucker for greens, yellows, and blues. I, I, I can't help it. I think that those three in some form of combination, I, I always gravitate back towards and I'll experiment and dip into other hues and shades and stuff. But like in some way, those three are like my perfect little happy spot. So, um, you know, if, you, if I'm just treating it like, you know, I'm not trying to be um, calculated. I don't have, um, you know, less like rhythms, amount of layers that I'm trying to get into. I really am just as I would with my paintings. Everything is very kind of like in the moment, energy of action, just kind of seeing how things go um, with what I have at my disposal. So I'm kind of like doing a first initial layer right now of some colors. I think it's probably good for now. So I think that's a pretty good start. And what's nice is since it's plaster, that can start to kind of like dry up. And then as I put the clay in there with all these various slips that I'm doing, it'll rip off onto the surface of the clay when I remove it later. Some question screen. yeah yeah so you have a painting in the exhibition is this like newer for you and your practice sorry this is a I couldn't I couldn't hear it too well just then what was that you're good you have a painting in the exhibition is this like is that like a newer process for you and I wanted to know if it's if it has impacted your ceramic process at all uh, it's a very newer process for me um I've always been doing painting with my clay for I mean the last decade um, and I, I have done watercolors, I've done printmaking, um, you know, woodcuts, um, linos. I, I've done oil painting before, but never in, in my own way. I've always done it in the form of class, learning technical skills. Um, how, do I, how do I mix this medium? How do I get the imposter that I want? It was, it was always with kind of a structure, never really um, finding it fitting with my own practice up until I think recently. Um, and that really came with, um, I think once I got to uh, the last couple of years, I, I kind of had a, a moment when I went to a residency at Penland where I was just out of the studio for a long, long, long time. And I, I, I wrote a proposal for literally five days. It's like, I wanted two weeks. They only gave me five days. Um, and they were like, oh, you'll probably knock it out that quickly. And I was just like, 
all right, well, I will. So I don't really have an option. Um, and so I, in five days, I was really determined um, to make about like 50 pots. I wanted to really have it as a moment to play and a moment for me to just kind of let loose all of the energy that I didn't get to let go of in grad school because I was being so calculated and I had these ideas about how things needed to be and was just putting all of these unnecessary pressures that didn't exist on, on me about my work. Um, and then I was without a studio after all that was over and I had time to like take a step back and process all of those things. And then going to Penland for this five days, I was like, I'm going to slather these in every single color that I know possible. And that was initially like a dumb, like one part like glaze test, two part, like I, I, I do just want to have a lot of fun. And then I started just falling in love when I started this series of how different glazes began to touch one another, how not traditional um, applications of transparents, opaques, satins, glosses, um, really began to create more of a variance as opposed to when I was trying to be careful and calculated with it before. I found that there was just this new excitement that was coming with my results. And so um, it just started overflowing from there. And so then I started doing watercolors sort of in the same fashion and trying to figure out what it was that I was replicating at Penland. Um, and then now, um, it's moved to canvas now that I, I've finally been breaking into like slowly working and bouncing between 2D, 3D, 2D, 3D, 2D, 3D. Um, the 2D is a long, uh, harder battle for me though. I can do I can do the surface and the painting and the how I know I, how I want my marks to be in the round and on clay, but it's been cool. When these things are on my floor, it's been really frustrating. <laughs> Fun, but frustrating. Yeah. And I just want to mention that um, if any of you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself and ask Paul directly. And if you just want, if you want to put them in the chat, we'll end up sorting through them. So yeah. All right, so I'm done getting like a good round of base colors in there and I'm pretty happy that those will probably not entirely but for the most part come with the composition of the surface later but now it's time to build um, so I have this white kind of stoneware clay that I'm using for right now um, I use various types of colored clays depending on what glazes and what colors that I'm trying to go for um, I really think about like my clay body um, sort of like gesso, um, how I want my piece to start, starts with what clay body color I'm choosing, what temperature I'm going to choose. And from there I can start figuring out like, oh, these hues aren't gonna be possible and these textures aren't gonna be possible, but these, these, these doors open up. So I'm gonna go with this new palette. So um, I'm choosing a really bright poppy palette with a rather white clay body that'll allow everything to really like pow, electrify once it goes into the kiln. So this is how I make my coils, by the way. I just get grab humps of clay from this mound that I have over here, just a straight block. And um, you know, if it starts up in a ball, just like this that I'm grabbing it from, take both of my hands, I'm getting it a nice kind of like press and squeeze, and then slowly but surely I'm letting gravity take hold. And it's moving through my fingers. I'll turn it upside down to even it out. And gravity's just done my work for me. And then I'm just kind of pressing this into a circle into the start, just slowly working out um, like a traditional coil pot, but I'm having the mold create like a support system for where I get to press into. And although you don't see the coil as much from this side of this interior shell, you'll see the pattern of it on the outside if you think about the reverse. So. Ah, now we have a train. It's one of my favorite things. So easy.
And um, I wanted to ask you, what kind of firings do you use? Because I know in your works, you use multiple firings. And how does that affect your final product? This may be a dumb question. I just don't know. I I'm, I'm, don't know much about ceramic, so no, that is not, not very new to me. Um, that is totally a super valid, and I love unpacking that question. Um, I have what is not a traditional potter's approach, but it's not uncommon within the clay world. Um, I just fire it until the piece is done. So a lot of potters, um, to not stress their wares, to kind of think about like what's going to carry the pieces safely through. They like to have a bisque firing, and then after the bisque firing, they like to have a glaze firing, and then you have a nice cooling for the glaze firing, and then hopefully the pot, one run done, looks really great. Um, I'm not really too worried about forms of utility. I can do utilitarian stuff, and I do utilitarian stuff, of course, but like, um, since I'm not worried about it, I kind of just like, you just go in the kiln three times, four times, five times, six times, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take it and push it to its limit if it's, if it's looking better and better or implodes on itself. Either way, it's fine. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Um, and that's okay too. I'd rather swing for the fences than be a little shy about it. Um, it's one of the only areas where I have control, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, normally, recently, I, I do about between three to three to four firings for each piece nowadays. I'll do an initial um, bisque firing. So I'll, I'll bring it to temperature to a point where it's changed to ceramic from clay. And then it's porous and can receive glaze. And uh, after that bisque firing, I'll do the glaze process. And that's kind of like where more of what I'm applying is like the glass forming material. Um, and then when I go to the glaze firing, that's gonna be higher in temperature than a bisque firing normally. Um, and so as I'll then go to my peak temperature and then work my way down and continue to apply if I think it's necessary more and more glazes if it's helping with the piece. Um, and then when it comes to the white gold and the gold, um, that's the lowest firing. And that's even actually below a bisque because metal can't really reach the same temperatures as um, ceramic or glass can. So I'm firing that at a, I say a low temperature, it's still at about like, 1,230 degrees Fahrenheit or so um, for the last final stage. But uh, I, I'm not gonna lie, I actually have a, a gold luster cooling right now and I just opened the peeps right before this demo and I'm fingers crossed really hoping that I get to do a nice counter reveal of some blingy stuff. Um, I got lucky about that in my studio practice today with timing. So I'm hoping that maybe I get to do a big like gold reveal. Yeah. Um, Kelly Aaron has a question. She asks, so is it under glaze you're applying to the clay at this point in the process? Yeah, so right now this is a mixture of velvet amico underglazes and I'm actually mixing them with some of my new favorites. Um, there's this stoneware wash also found at Crane Yard Clay. Um, this is a stoneware wash that's made by Mako. Um, it's got a little bit of manganese in it so it's a black uh, slip. So um, it actually underneath my glazes has been going this beautiful when I thinned it out sepia, which I like. It, it almost looks like um, like bleeding ink in water. So I've been really fond of it and not applying it in a uniform fashion and watching the variants kind of like unfold once I submerge it underneath some clears. So um, yeah, it's just a bunch of washes and slips so far. Kelly says, nice, dig it. Cool. <laughs> So now we're getting to the fun, tricky point of this process where um, I almost have the inside filled out and uh, I'm gonna have to now coil build the top of the sphere and I'm gonna have to enclose basically this basketball shape in on itself. Um, and the reason why I do that is for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, I'm trapping air inside the piece when I do that. So just like I have the support to this plaster mold, that's kind of cradling these coils as I'm kind of pressing and making the walls even from the inside. Once I trap air in this ball, that air um, will hold and it'll be like another invisible hand from the outside and I'll be able to finish and support and do some finishing touches on the outside of this sphere um, while it's kind of still like wobbling in stasis. Um, 
which I'll be giving it a couple of like paddles just to give it some some nice form for the bottom. That way it has kind of like a nice raised curve like this one kind of does. Kind of hard to see. But. And this is why I also, I mean, I love this kick wheel. This kick wheel is probably my favorite thing. Um, favorite studio tool of all time. Um, Cause it, I mean, you could do this on a banding wheel or like Lazy Susan, whatever you want to call it on a tabletop. But there's something about me being allowed and you can't see that. Everything that's spinning right now is me with my foot just kind of like slowly kind of like kicking the wheel around and it's, oh, couldn't be any easier for me being used to this process. Um, to me, your work kind of has this like playfulness to it. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that playfulness comes out in your process or would you say your process is more like you stick to the rules and um, yeah. I think I took the line of um, following rules and going into overplay. Um, I kind of need to go into that state of play though to keep myself engaged and feel really happy about new development within results. Um, so the playfulness helps there and then also um, it is not talked about too often. I like using playfulness as a guise for someone to come in closer to my work. Um, Cause then I know that my language can be a little tough to read in my text, but um, I do touch on sometimes like more serious topics. And so I think some people can be alert into the surface and want to come and see the gold and see the glitz. And then all of a sudden you're reading a story about like, oh, a phone conversation where my dad with Alzheimer's fades off into nothing and he's lost his speech. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of multi-reason purpose of why I keep things playful. It also is an engagement moment for me to talk about more serious topics. Um, your your vessels kind of act as these like snapshots of like everyday moments in your life or like what's happening in our world. Um, how does your process help sort of like fossilize that? Um, it's it's kind of exactly what drew me to clay. I love the his my my degree in art history only showcased like I'm such a dork. Uh, I love history and I love. Um, as I was going through history, I was so alert by the fact that, you know, here's this archival material that stands the test of time that goes back to the Grecians, or even before that, you look over Japan, or you look at the Venus of Villendorf, and how that helped people so far, but like the ceramic continuum is crazy and stretches so many quarters of the globe. There, you just can't beat it. I don't know, for me anyway, it, it, it just, it's a history that you can just go into forever. And so it felt really natural for me, of course, if once I decided that I actually wanted to take more of the route of being a visual artist rather than a historian, like, oh, well, I'm gonna go with the most archival material. I'm going to play. Uh, so that makes no sense. Um, specifically, since I, you know, during that time I was making pottery as well. Like, um, you know, even during my first art history degree, I was finding communal potter, pottery shops in Athens, Georgia. Um, I had two years down at Georgia Southern where although I started art history there, I was also doing clay the whole time too. And those were my first wood fire kilns like just outside of Savannah, Georgia. Um, so I, it, I yeah, it, I kind of think in, in certain ways it was, it's weird, but also like, oh, kind of natural when you think about it. Yeah. Oh, we're getting close. The dome is closing. So I'm kind of going up and in right now as I'm pinching, which is not something that you can necessarily see, but we're almost there. Closer and closer. 
It is both a fast and slow process at the same time, coiling. I love it. It's very tedious. You may not think it when you look at my work and the kind of the playfulness, but a lot of ceramics just in general is total tediousness. And so there's something really satisfying to do all of this life work and then just be like, Do you, you don't have to know this, um, but do you know, like historically speaking, where the process of coiling comes from or where it was used at all? Some of the oldest coiling forms that I know of on record started in Jomon, Japan, which is Neolithic period. So rather old. And those are still to this day, some of the most intricate pots I've ever seen in my entire life. But um, coiling has been around for thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years. Um, and there's so many traditions that have taken it to such different places, it's crazy. Um, but man, yeah, those Jomon pots, those are super old and they're, God, they're stunning. They're so good. I mean, you have these like tall, elegant forms and then these like rope-like alien formations that are all stacked on top of one another at the top. I mean, unbeatable. I, um, I had to go um, for wedding travel this weekend to Chicago and I got to skate away by myself and have a day in the Art Institute. And I forgot and saw a lot of those Jomon pots, um, along with some like T-Bowl ceremony vessels and a lot of other things in clay that I normally would miss in Art Institute because I, I run right towards the paintings normally. <laughs> so I got, I got to focus more on the clay stuff this time. Very cool. I should. Um, man, yeah, those Jomon pots are rocking and rolling. They're so cool. Time travelers, man. They're in, they're in the future somewhere and they skip back to make that stuff. Um, I wanted to also mention, I know a lot of ceramists um, that when they're doing this coil process, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't do this, but I, I know a lot of individuals that will laboriously like make their slab and then they do a scratching or a scoring of the place where they're do, doing the mark and then they'll apply some water and then they'll apply some slip and they'll do the same thing in the coil. And then look at, the reason why I'm not doing that is because of it is exactly why I'm choosing this mold and why I'm choosing this method and why this is able to work in the way that it's working right now is um, all of this I'm adding wet into the wet into the wet and since both the air and the plaster supports itself I can do these tricky things as long as I just don't add water. If I don't add water counterintuitively to ceramics everything will hold. So this is like the whole reason why I'm doing this like all just straight wet coils and just ripping and ripping is because if you add water you'll actually make this all collapse. So you just have to be patient and Pinch right. So this is the tricky part. And uh, this is, took me a minute to figure out how to do this one. Um, so now I gotta get to a point where I'm enclosing this and it's like, well, how do you, how do you, how do you pinch it off? And it kind of looked a little bit like, not like a random crazy enough. Um, I kind of take the diameter of this top part and kind of like a bottleneck. Um, I'm kind of taking it up taller and taller and taller and I'm leaving the clay a little bit thicker up here, as opposed to how it was a little bit thinner in the walls down here. And I don't mind that I leave it thicker at this point because this is where I'm putting the foot anyway. So if there's a little bit of extra weight in the butt that gives some stability for the table, but it still visually lifts, that's, that's fine with me. I'll compromise that. It's not a pot that you're gonna pick up and anything like that. So I don't care if it's a little on the heavy side. Kind of got this small little opening now. Good. 
Now, if I apply just this last bit of clay to kind of plug it, I can kind of pinch. That's closed up now. Um, I have this uh, handy dandy little piece of metal that uh, I got when I was working at the Kohler factory. And uh, it's, it's just the perfect little scraper, former paddler. I love this thing. Um, it's kind of now at this point, I'll kind of refine some of this tear that I just made and uh, begin kind of, I can do and scrape and push into this thing now because since I trapped that spot, all the air is supporting it from the inside. So I'm kind of allowed to push into it. As long as I don't poke a hole, it won't collapse. So I'm okay for now being a little careful, but um, on the whole. Marissa said, this is really mar remarkable to watch. You make it look so easy. Doing it, doing it for a minute. <laughs> it took me a while to figure out too. Like, um, like I, I had this mold ready when I was working at Kohler. Um, and that was like starting back in, I think like 2018, 2019. Um, I had to like, just think about it for like probably a year. Just like, will it work? I don't know if it's going to work. I can't buy that clay right now. I don't even know what it's like. I, I just have to sit and think about it. Um, so, although it may look easy in the process, uh, it's a time to get the courage to be like, nope, it'll, it'll work. So now you can, this is just a two, two by four piece of wood down. Um, it's a perfect paddling tool. And so I normally wouldn't do this at this stage, but just to kind of show you what I was meaning from before, um, I want to make sure that this is kind of like as close to centered as possible. And by centered, I mean just like at a point where I can see like this is the dead like middle of this sphere. Um, you know, because I want to kind of send it even, but I don't want it to be too far off leaning and off kilter. It's kind of nice if I have it in the center and then see how the neck begins to like take out from space. Um, well, that's kind of what I'm going for for now. Maybe a weird foot comes later. But, um, See how the progression goes, I suppose. So now that I kind of have this, it looks close to center. I just have like a, a hunting knife or like a camping knife. Um, my partner bought me these, she's the best. Um, thank you, Sam. They're just traditional offanels. You can find them at like a kind of like Cabela's or something like that. They're awesome. They have this really perfect French curve. Um, if you want to do some more figure sculpture, but also these are like carbon blade so they just rust and rust and rust and uh, you want a rusty blade with clay because if you have a sparkling new blade of metal it's going to stick to the clay all the time so the rustier the better and these rust up good so now i'm kind of like scratching a ring right now into the bottom so that's going to allow me to attach a coil of clay here to the outside of this Then this is just a little bit of water in a brush. Um, I'm just kind of getting wet all the toothy clay that I just kind of like dug up. That way I have a nice texture you, you want when you're attaching something. You don't want to be light to skimp on scorn and slipping and sealing. Um, the less you do, the less likely it's going to turn out correct. So um, you really want to be thorough with that, that part of the process if you have to do it. Um, now I'm kind of just forming. I'm going to form this little ring down first. Kind of make sure it's well pressed on there. So I'm just kind of like with the side of my knife, just kind of like mashing down this coil into this kind of scored and slip part. But I'm not worried about looking toothy. I'm going to refine that up in a minute. I just want to make sure that I have a lot of blending in with both clay bodies, so I know that it's, it's well attached. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Sam, Sam asked, do you pre-plan your forms? I'm sorry? 
Sam asked if you pre-plan your forms. My form, sometimes I do. I have an idea for this one that I've been thinking about since yesterday. I'm gonna see how it goes when I open it and you'll see what I mean by that in a second and see if that even works and if it's possible. But uh, I have an idea for that one. So yeah, I, I do think about like, as I'm building these, cause I have like two days to kind of like think about it. Like, oh, well it's coming up. What's the next step? What's the next shape? So yeah, I do sometimes think about it. Not sometimes, almost all the time. It's very rare when I get to it and I'm like blanking. Um, I usually have a plan by the time I get there. But not sold to the plan. I'll pivot if need be because Clay has a mind of its own sometimes and that's just the way it is. And I wanted to ask, um, how do you negotiate what shape you use? And I know you mentioned the moon jars, but is there anything else that like inspires you to use this sort of like specific shape? Um, not most directly um, and not for this one, no. Um, specifically because I, I love this shape and I love this form that I've been making recently. But um, I have actually a long hundred list of other silhouettes that I, that I do too. So like um, the minute that I finished this body of work, I actually started um, building just a series of straight cylinders, just straight two foot tall cylinder vessels that have the tiniest opening. Um, I have some other like tulip jars that are kind of a more traditional silhouette over here. Um, but this, this particular form now, it's most directly stemming from that point, but now quickly moving away and, um, the necks have been so fun to kind of just play with because they're so not in that traditional arena of what the neck of the vessel is supposed to be. And, um, that's where I'm starting to like play around at old history, things of my like own personal history or like what's happening at that exact moment. Like there's one vessel that I had when I got to the neck. I called that one La Formica because um, it, it to me it looks like ant pincers um, more than anything in an Italian La Formica. Ant. Um, trying to learn Italian right now. Um, I'm failing miserably at it but I'm trying my best. Uh, so that was, that was me thinking so plainly into just like ah oh, man I hope like the combination of this Duolingo reading comic books and finding music is working. So now that I have that coil, I'm just building off that one coil and it's just going up and up and up. And so just like I had before, this is how the foot begins to rise once I have the, the spheres more complete. So although I had that score slipping and sealing process to get that initial coil going, just so I, I know that that connection is good, went right back to just wet on wet coils right after that though. How do you um, come up with like what colors um, and glazes you want to use? Um, I'm frequently collecting and trying to also utilize what's at my disposal for places that I go. Um, this has been my first consistent studio since grad school. Um, so since about 2017, I've just been figuring it out from place to place, making work wherever and however I could in clay. Um, and so as I was going, I was just kind of adapting and collecting like colors, temperatures, things for whatever thing was possibly available at the next location where I was able to make work. Um, and so because of that now, uh, the selection is getting pretty fun now. So this is kind of like, walls of all the various colors and temperatures that I start with. Um, so I think less about, um, this may sound weird, but I think less about um, the initial color as I do 
um, the material and the possibility and the order of operation of the material first. So like when I, to choose the color of the vessel that I started here, um, I was like, oh, well, if I want my first round of colors here, I need to apply slip first. Well, what slips do I have available right now? I have green, I have black, I have blue. I haven't busted it out yet. I'm gonna put it on the other vessel, but I have a, a little bit of uh, canary yellow. Um, and so that kind of, if that becomes my base and part of the gesso of also the white, um, then it's sort of like, we'll see how the saturation looks from the kiln. And then I'll sort of emotively react from there. Cause sometimes I'll apply that initial round of um, slips. And that is the one that has most, the most opacity in it. There's no glass warmer or anything to thin that out and to kind of dilute colors. And so since that becomes um, so opaque with the first round of the clay surface. Um, I see kind of like the hue, darkness, and you know saturation of that first layer, and then I kind of begin to go from there, and then that, that kind of begins to determine a little bit more um, whether themes are going to be a little bit more bright in theme or take kind of a more serious tone, or sometimes the color doesn't have any consequence or pay mind at all, and sometimes like topics are just going to happen, and then it's a whole um mashing together um so i don't know that's kind of it's kind of loaded it really is sort of the color choice is far more intuitive um and i'm reliant more on material a lot of times and what's available but um i think what helps too is if i'm building the vessel and i know what words i want to etch in I, I i normally know the words and kind of the theme of the words that i want to etch in first um, sometimes that will allow me. That's kind of the only moment where I like I have any indication of like a guide or a path. Um, it's when the words aren't there for the vessel first that I'm just like, oh, let's play. Time to figure out where the mood of this vessel is going. So. I just forgot I'm making work. This is just a knife. I just want to level off this foot. So this is, this is like totally flat. Um, I know that that will make this surface flat and also on the table flat. Or not table, pedestal, wherever it goes. That's how you build that structure. But now, going back to Julia Child style, go to the other one now. Hang on. So now we're at the point where I can begin opening this up and start making some more like formal and visual decisions. So um, most important thing that I've known uh, since yesterday is that I wanted this piece to be green. I don't know why, uh, but I wanted this to be a predominantly green piece. Um, I think that's probably just thinking of the last week. Um, thank you to everyone that came to the opening and that made everything feel so celebrated, but it's been a really like positive, like sequence of the last couple of days. So I wanted to have a nice poppy green piece, I think, to start for today. So actually, uh, part of my process that um, I had a friend who was adamant that I needed to show, because um, it doesn't always come from handwork carving uh, brushes. There's a lot of times where I do old school method of atomizing. So I will showcase how I am doing that and how I'm getting some certain really light color fades on some stuff. Um, so this is probably my favorite painting tool of all time. This is my handy dandy atomizer. Um, it's a nice tin can that has this down step and this top filler. And as this goes down with my forced air of breath, it's going to allow me to use this like a spray paint can. And I'm going to allow it to apply everything to my surfaces using clay medium. So I choose my color.
Sam asks, how long do you wait between building the forms and starting these steps that you're doing now? Normally, what I did just now, I'll wait for that to dry for a solid 24 hours, and that tends to allow it to get to a point where I'm able to have it stand on its own and me not worry about it too much, of like collapsing or hitting a weak point, like popping over. Um, and then the, the build of the rest of the body happens within like one more day. So really a two to three day turnaround to build these full tilt. Um, but that's if I'm treating them one by one. If like I did just now, I keep going for the next couple of days, I'll, I can have another moon jar done. That's provided if I have time. There's so much stuff at Belgium that I don't. I, I, I'm not just able to knock these out all the time. But um, but if I if I want to, I, I can get in a production rhythm mode with this like I would my normal power. Um, which is convenient because I want to make a lot of these and sometimes my time is limited and that's why I've kind of curtailed it to kind of go in this like kind of quick step multi-day process. Um, but without further ado, here comes the atomizing. So I'm getting some nice like variation on the surface now with how that's allowed me to use controlled breath for a lot of points and also get some kind of like more subtle fades. But now what I'm gonna do is start really painting into it with some brushes, maybe go back in with the atomizer and just start kind of like working in and out. Um, I tend to apply all these colors first before I carve the words. I've been thinking about like what I'm going to carve into this for a minute, but um, got to strike when it's hot with the wet and the wet on the clay. So this is that black that I, I said I'm really liking that it's having when it's thinned out a nice washed sepia effect so I don't mind that I'm using it more in a painterly fashion. I'm not trying to have these even coats or anything, just whatever, not a consequence to me. Are you um, inspired by, or like what painters are you inspired by? Um, that was a good move, sorry. <laughs> Um, I, my earliest, 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 earliest influence is Cy Twombly. Um, I was born in Houston, Texas, and the Cy Twombly Museum is there. And I definitely, my mom is so great. She was adamant about just always taking us to museums after museum. Um, so I'm, I, I always have had a lifelong love for Cy. Um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, of course. Um, I, I love graffiti and hip hop culture. And so being able to delve into where that influences his painting, his relationship with Rommelsey and seeing how, you know, he was uh, working and thinking about visual art in um, just so many, so many contexts and being able to bring things together and also in his color palette for sure. Um, I love Helen Frankenthaler. I think that there are subtle blends and um, reinventiveness that she was able to art with every single one of her stages of her career that I just find to be incredibly impressive. I hope, 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 hope that I can figure out how to keep myself as fresh like that throughout the decades. Um, and then uh, for painters, I also, I also really love painter printmaker uh, Howard Hodgkins. I think he also has just this really bright, happy palette that I, I gravitate towards a lot too. Um, I would say that those four are probably the biggest for me right now. Um, though I have others, I also really like uh, Michael Rice Snyder. Um, I think he has a really great uh, positive cynicism within his work that I, I find really intriguing. Um, 
yeah, yeah, whole whole litany, whole litany. Um, I also like the traditional painters and stuff too. I think there's some really great stuff when looking into like some crazy like bodily formations, which will cue some silhouettes from like Hieronymus Bosch and like not just the colors that he's making, but his crazy like creatures that he'll make. And I'm just like, oh, well, how would I, how would I make a ceramic thing do this kind of like side step sort of thing, you know, like totally think about that as well. Um, yeah, yeah, short answer. And just a heads up, we are nearing towards 7.30. I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. And also, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute or to put them in the chat box. I was going to say, it's also perfect timing. I'm about to hit the point where now I'm going to open. So this has been forced air the whole time in here, which is why I'm still doing what I'm doing. I'm about to untrap the air for the first time, build the neck, and then I'm going to be able to carve the words in, in the last five minutes. Oh, I've done it. It's all coming together. So if anyone was wondering what those circles are on my pieces um, that I keep including on everything, it's totally this cookie cutout that I'm making right now. I don't like things to go to waste. <laughs> So I really, after I paint it and I'm ripping out the surface of this painting, I keep that intact. And I'll reattach the composition of that part of the painting elsewhere later. On tape day. So now this is a nice ring that's exposed. I, it's still wet from the inside, but leather hard on the outside. So I can still do some really nice slick attachments right now. And so I'm kind of pinching and pinching this upwards so it's starting to already form its own neck without me needing to add anything. And although it's still wet from the inside since it's leather hard on the outside, I'll add just a little bit of moisture as I do this attachment, but then just like build a neck. Sophia Reed says, I got to get some of that stoneware wash. It's beautiful. No, the stoneware wash is tripping me out at how good it is. Like, oh, it has like the perfect thinness and runs like skim milk. It's like the perfect consistency. And I like that my hands are dirty right now. I had a professor in grad school. Malcolm Mobutu Smith, I owe that man so much. Um, I owe all, all my faculty everything, but um, he, he would do this exercise called Butterfingers. You're not allowed to make work the whole day unless your hands are filthy. And that really allowed me to like, that was one of the first steps of letting go. Um, last but not least is the last tool I'll use since now I have most of a neck form. Full tilt since I can't do it in five minutes, but I want y'all to know the plan. I want to go rather tall with the neck. I had a piece that I gave away as a trade gift that I didn't get to show in the show. And I really love these tall, tall, tall cylinder necks still open. So that's probably where the end of this one's going to go. So you can check out my Insta to see how the form finishes in a little bit. But I wanted to show you this is my favorite carving tool. Um, this is a Scraffito tool from Korea. Um, my friend Kyungmin Park, she was my professor at UGA, and she's a wonderful ceramicist. Um, she gave me this tool, and I appreciate this tool because it's this flat panel with the carving on the side, so it fits really nice into my hand. Um, so I'm sort of obsessed with it, and this is going to allow me to carve really like nice finite letters into all of the sides of my vessel. So now it's the perfect stage to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I like that bit that you brought up about letting go. I don't have much experience with ceramics. I only took one ceramic class and it was actually a mold making class, but I felt like at times it's a medium that can be really unforgiving. Do you find yourself having to like cope with that at all when you're making or? In failure, consistent failure. Um, don't even care anymore. I, I, I've, I've blown and failed so many things at this point that I'm just kind of numb to it. And it, when things work out, it's like, oh, I did it. <laughs> cool. So I can just move on from there at this point. It doesn't matter. Like, and that kind of goes back to how I was feeling earlier. I'll crash and burn all day if I can get at least one thing to work right. And it's not to say that I don't have consistency in other regards for other things that I make within my practice. But when it comes to my art, I'm swinging for the fences. A lot of it doesn't turn out, but when it does turn out, God, it's a good bit. Right on. And that's how the jar ends up. <clears throat> and so now that I've carved and made recesses with traditional scraffito process, that's what allows me then to take the luster at the very end stage after I keep adding layers and layers and layers of glaze to still come on top of all of the surface that I'm viewing from even this early stage and onward and allows me to still sit all the gold on top of that. And so I predetermine all of my word structure as all that surface would develop. Um, but then in some moments, the, the surface takes over and that's okay too. Sometimes things just get lost in the shuffle, like we all do. Um, but that's, that's kind of how I, I try to keep the words as mostly intact as possible. And if we're lucky, I'm gonna go look at my kiln right now. We're all gonna have a walk through the studio. This is our studio. These are our wonderful classes going on. I'm heading over to my kiln to see if those letters that I just carved, I had a luster firing this morning that went off. Uh, it's been cooling for the majority of the day. So as I'm now walking to the back, we're now in my kiln room of our studio. Woo! Ah, literally 30 degrees too hot. So I got about like 30 more minutes to wait. Um, but so I can't open that right now. That sucks. Oh, I was so close. All right. But, um, but in the end, that's how all of the surfaces develop on all that work. Sophia said better see it on Insta later. That's, I was going to say, if you, if you follow that Insta handle, PCV Maloney, um, I will have it posted. I talk about like dork stuff. Um, I <laughs> love the photography part in the end and taking nice formal slides. There's, there's no happier moment than when you see me going to the photo booth and I'm about to edit for hours on the computer. Because at that point, the scary part is done. Kelly asks, is the luster fire after the bisque and then the mid fire? Love the layering up. So the luster firing is after everything. So I, I do the bisque and I do multiple stages of glaze. Um, recently it's cone six and then I go down to cone 04 and I'll do some layers at the bisque temperature again. And then below that, um, I'll fire the gold after I have all my glazes set. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for sharing your work and your process with us. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. I really appreciate it. And Kelly also says the crackling is groovy. What's that? The crackling is groovy. Oh, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love fudging with crackles. But yeah, if, um, if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Speak now or forever hold your peace. 
Um, thank you again, Paul. This was absolutely phenomenal. I learned so much. This was so great. Um, and Paul's work will be up until the end of the month. Come see it. He's showing with two other artists, Glenn Meese and Paige Nicole Gordon. So come by and hang out. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Paul.